Thank you everyone for being here this evening. I think everyone knows who I am, Catherine Nahorski, the Executive Director of the St. Louis Artists Guild. And thank you so much for joining in. Our format's gonna be a little different this evening in uh, we are going to watch uh, two short videos of the artists. We're gonna do that sort of one at the time. We're gonna start with Alex and, uh, and then we'll have opportunity to uh, ask Alex questions either during the video or after. And at that point, um, you could unmute or use chat and then we'll go to Susie's video and and then if we have some direct questions for Susie. And after that, we welcome everyone to unmute themselves so that we can just have an open dialogue about the artist's work and their inspiration and, um, and what inspires us also. So Alex, we're gonna start with you and Zach's going, Zach is here, our master tech guy. <laughs> and he is going to start the video. And again, please mute yourself uh, during this time. So uh, here we go. I'm Alex Paradowski. When the Guild told me that there were people interested in how I put together my mosaics, I was just getting ready to start this piece, which is my latest, it's a portrait of my son. So when I started that, I decided to chronicle each of the steps so I could show them on this video. So what you're about to see is a step-by-step -step process of how this particular piece came to be. What you see here is the photograph I started with and the three contenders for the piece of art. Top left is a photo of my son, Nick, that was the original. And the other three are Photoshop variations. I will, on every piece, start by bumping the contrast, pushing the color, and seeing just what I can do. The top right, I kicked out right away. The bottom two became contenders. I put my 15 by 15 grid on both of those and uh, finally selected the one bottom left. That's the one we're doing here today. After I've decided on a piece, even though I've printed it out, pixelated, I grid it off in squares of 15. This corresponds to trays that I'll show you later in this video. The very first step is I shred paper. I shred the excess paper that comes out of our laser printers, junk mail, sales flyers, newsprint, just about anything. I take shredded paper in a blender with water. After it's finished blending, it ends up being a thick slurry. Um, and my next step is to get rid of some of that water and leave it in a uh, just a thick chunk in a way that I can store it. I then take this slurry, pour it into a piece of screen, and use the screen so that I can squeeze out all the excess water. Pretty basic. What I'm left with then is a thick, damp chunk of paper. This is something I can take and store uh, for use later to make into pellets. So after the paper is made, I store it in plastic tubs in a refrigerator. So anytime I can pull out a chunk like this and start making cubes, I push them into my, uh, this grid here is clamped down, you see the clamps, uh, to keep it secure and to keep the bottom of it firm against this piece of wood so that the bottom of the pellet uh, stays nice and flat. Otherwise, it goes through the bottom, expands, makes the cubes hard to get out, um, and makes the bottom a very inconsistent, some round, some flat. Anyway, so I push it in here, one after one. 
I uh, sometimes use a tool to push it in, keep it firm, get the paper fibers all sort of locked together. So when the cube comes out, it's nice and tight. You uh, get used to knowing about how much to pinch off to make a cube. And the other tool I use is this piece of wood cut to about the same size as the opening. So I can push it down again, make the paper firm, give me a uh, relatively consistent finish on the cube. After the grid, which is from an old fluorescent light fixture, is full, I dry the pellets with a fan overnight. The next morning, I take and knock the pellets out of the uh, mold and store them in these plastic tubs. When full, I believe these three tubs hold about 10,000 pellets. The piece I'm working on here, the portrait of my son, is just over 2,000 pellets. So when these tubs are full, I've got enough for maybe five or six pieces of art. After I've dried the paper pellets and released them from the mold, uh, they'll often have little burrs on them like this. And if I leave that on there, after they're painted, that becomes very hard, becomes brittle, and can break off. Work off then uh, under it would probably be white. So uh, before I paint the pellets, I go through several at a time and trim them a little bit, just so they're a little more consistent. Shown here is my collection of almost 100 baby food jars full of paint. I keep the colors, the various colors from each piece of art. And then as I need new colors, I'll either mix new colors or I'll edit the colors I have to make it warmer or cooler, whatever I happen to need. I've made these foam core trays to hold 15 cubes by 15 cubes. These correspond to the grid that I work off of and it makes it easy to assemble. This tray corresponds to the first square of this grid. So I've got all nine of them filled. And so the square, the trays let me easily glue these in place. So I'm gonna start now by gluing these pellets in place according to that first square. I hot glue these. Use pieces of wood to keep them square, get them in tight. That's one square of 15 by 15. What's left to do now are the other eight squares, mounting and framing. So shown here is my original reference, pixelated and with the grid, shown next to the finished mounted framed uh, portrait of my son. So you can see here, even though these are shot in the different lighting conditions, how close they come out. That lets me look at a photo uh, pixelated and have a pretty good idea what I'm going to finish up with in the end. Indeed, astounding. Alex, if you could unmute yourself, please. That is just excellent. The part, uh, where I was, the part where I was pressing the paper into the grid, I thought kind of went on long and it was boring, but it isn't, <laughs> wasn't nearly as boring as doing it. Making, making the paper <laughs> pellets, it, it's just labor. <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to ask a question of 
for Zach. And, and he was wondering how long did it take you to develop this process? I mean, how did you come up with this process? Well, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, fabric pieces I was doing before that. But I was doing these fabric pieces and I actually did a self-portrait with the fabric and it, it, how these pieces, you have to step back to see it. With the fabric, you had to get back twice as far because it was just more abstract. And I was looking for a way to uh, tie that a little tighter. And I'm not sure where the paper idea came from, except that I had those pieces of grid laying around for years. Uh, I'm one of those people that will save something because I'll need it someday. Well, it finally worked. Uh, I needed it someday. And uh, I, I just tried it. And when I first tried it, I did, I did the grid over a piece of screen, thinking I'd push all the water out that way. Uh, what happens is the screen isn't tight, so the paper just pushes through. So then I developed that little board thing that I work on. Uh, and then I tried one. And the first one was a portrait of my wife. And uh, I make the pellets better now. There are a lot of, lot of rough edges and more variation in size. And uh, it just wasn't, it came together after doing several of them. But um, sort of stumbled on the idea and later found out that, uh, um, oh, I always forget his name. The guy that does the huge portraits. Chuck Close? Yeah, Close. He has used, that's a, that, just, that plastic grid is from an old fluorescent fixture. And Close will sometimes use aluminum grids, the same size, but he'll embed the entire grid. He'll pour paper over it, let it dry, embed several four by eight grids or two by four grids. And then he has a team of people with dyes, uh, dye in each one. And mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm posterizing and doing work in Photoshop. Whereas I think he's uh, taking the photo apart and just matching it exactly. But uh, I thought I invented it, but I think close was first. <laughs> well, well, you brought it to us. How's that? Okay. Yes, great. You know, I have not, I have seen some of your fabric work, but I don't believe I have seen fabric work where you were doing a portrait. Is that on your website? Uh, I think it is. I only one because uh, it has to be black and white because the, the color variants I can't get in fabric, uh, which was another reason to look for another way of doing it. Um, so most of my fabric stuff is not portraiture. Uh, it's either uh, a graphic or more abstract, but not, not portraits. Um, anyway, I did a couple of portraits when I was testing to see if I could. Uh, I did one of Marilyn Monroe and I did one of uh, John Lennon, but those are famous photos. So, you know, I can't do anything with those. Uh, the other work on your, your website is abstract. So what, what moved you to portraiture? Well, that's a long story. Uh, <laughs> I, used to, I used to work a lot uh, with yardsticks. I'd paint, I'd glue yardsticks down, make that my canvas, if you will. And then I worked over the top of that. And then after I got done painting on it, I'd come back and sand and scrape and so the numbers would come through in places and not in others. Um, but I, I bought a piece of sculpture 30 years ago uh, <clears throat> that has these little threads hanging off of it. And I've always been enamored with those little yellow threads hanging off of that piece of sculpture. And I was looking for a way to do something with threads, which is how I got into the fabric. And uh, then the fabric led me to the paper. Uh, and uh, in December, I did another fabric piece. I hadn't done a fabric piece in probably four years. And then I did one in December and I've got a couple working now. Um, the wood um, is more, uh, takes more shop. And uh, I don't have as much shop as I used to have. Um, but I'll, I'll still do some yardstick pieces, but 
probably not for a while. I mean, there's a lot of spray painting and it's toxic and I never do it in a well-ventilated area. And I don't think to put on a, a respirator until the room is already full of fumes. So, which irritates the hell out of Nyla. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and then the fumes go upstairs and I get in trouble. So uh, the, pa <laughs> the paper works out a lot better. <laughs> uh, well, yes, those things make a difference. Uh, what type of studio you have in space can dictate uh, the process and work that you're currently doing. Yeah, I, I, I do the figure studies and portraits, but I've done some still lives and I'm working on a floral now, but uh, the figures and the portraits seem to lend themselves to that technique better than most other things. Well, I, I had, honestly, when you first brought your work to the Artists Guild, I was amazed at uh, being across the room when I saw the pixels, your little squares of color form a very realistic portrait. Uh, because, you know, when the work first comes in, we're handling it, we're up close, it looks very abstract. I could see, you know, that there was a portrait or a person in there. But once the work is up, and, and, and especially in a space like the Artist Guild where you can really get back, it was just stunning to see how how realistic that adds up. And so I, I, you were really great at color mixing. I love those baby jars <laughs> <laughs> and your little tabs on them. You know, you, you're you're very organized. Well, actually, um, I use the tabs. Uh, I, I need to put the tab down on the the computer printout to see where I am because uh, you'll look at a color and boy, you'll think you've, you've got it until you put the piece of paper down next to the square and you see it's way too red or way too dark. Uh, it's a real lesson in what colors look like next to each other because mm. as, you, as you look at it, it's hard to isolate from its surroundings. Uh, so sometimes I actually have a piece of paper with a little square cut out that I can lay down on the square and look at it by itself and things that will look pink are really more lavender or, or you know, the more blue or more, more red uh, that really gets lost when they're surrounded by browns and oranges and other things. Yes, yes. Joseph Albers. Right, exactly. <laughs> Joseph Albers and Design 101 or whatever. I remember painting right. all those little squares, uh, but it's fun and wonderful and it is amazing how color affects each other. So are there any other questions right at the moment for Alex? All right. So next we're going to watch a video of Susie and her process in her studio. And I think one thing that's really fun about the two artists this evening is that they have very different process for their work, but they use similar materials. And I love, I always love how an individual changes something and how different all of our work turns out. So um, we're next gonna watch uh, a video from Susie Farron and I think Zach's gonna get us started. Susie Farron and I used to be a writer for my whole career and now I am an artist but it didn't happen overnight it took me many years of taking classes with a whole variety of people to get to where I am today which is always growing and always changing so today I'm gonna show you what I how I use my sketchbook to um, develop pieces of art and my art is basically in, very intuitive, um, although there's a lot of 
there's a lot of, do you like it? Do you not like it? What's working? What's not working? So there's a lot of thought that goes into it also. But I do start with just really playing with marks in my sketchbook. I love to make marks. And so it's very, very busy. I'll maybe glue something down. I'll glue a bunch of stuff down. And maybe I'll like it, maybe I won't. I'm not trying to make anything specific. I'm just, I'm just doing it. So I do this with maybe some uh, crayons or charcoal or um, sumi ink or walnut ink. And I find little scraps because I have a million little scraps of paper because I can't throw anything away. And I'll glue those little scraps of paper or sometimes cloth down on my page. And I'll just keep doing that for quite a while. And then we'll see, we'll see what happens. So glue, glue, glue. And so if you look at it now, it's really nothing. It's kind of just a mess. So the next thing I'll do is I'll try to kind of find, okay, what's in here that I like? What's in here that I don't like? And so maybe I'll take some paper and cover up some of the marks that I don't like. So that, so that something will emerge. It's, it's actually quite a, a long process that goes on over time. And always I lose my, my, my clue or I lose whatever I'm supposed to be working with. But when you do this, it's very interesting. And what I'm gonna do is sort of show you the end product because I don't wanna bore you to death um, with me gluing over marks I've just made. You can see how intuitive it is. It's just, you just are taking your pencil or your crayon and making marks and then covering them up. So, after I've done this for a while and covered them back up, covered certain things up, then you kind of say, oh, okay, so what do I have here? And I'll show you how we go from this process of just mess all over the page to finding some images that, that I like. And this is made by using some uh, acrylic. This is probably Sumi ink. This is collaged. And it's almost like a little image. You can almost see a little house. Maybe it's a tree. Maybe that's the moon. Maybe this is, I don't know what. But, um, I, I don't know what this is, but, but I'm getting rid of some of those marks that make it so cluttered and just really don't add to the overall coherence of the piece. I think that's what I, I try to do. I try to get a, a coherent piece that actually means something to me. And in this one, this is one of my favorites. This turned out to be a barn with a horse in winter. Who knew? And that's just from these random marks. But I find things that I that that have meaning or that don't have meaning. I just like I like the movement in this piece. Um, so then, oh, here's a photograph of a cat in a window, and this is an old rusted piece of paper. And I I really like this piece. But, you know, 
I think the interesting thing about this is that it's, I didn't just come and, and, and draw this or paint it. There's a lot of energy in these pieces, but they're covered up and they, they just form whatever they end up forming. Um, here's another, here's shutters maybe, here's the sun pouring in. It's a windowsill possibly, maybe it's the outside of a building. But they evoke something, and I think that's what I look for in my in my work. And this is just the sketchbook. I really like these shapes, the way they work together. Excellent. That, that, that's beautiful, Susie. Very nice. Yeah, very nice. So uh, intuitive. And first of all, the sketchbook. So you make your own sketchbook. Uh, that particular one I did not make. I'd love to make books, but that particular one, it had a lot of pages. I probably, I don't know, I would get confused before I could make something so big. So, um, <laughs> but. but but what I, what I like about it is, what I re, I've been realizing lately is that it's, it is intuitive. And I, at the beginning, I mentioned that I was a writer. And when I was a writer, I was always finding the perfect words. And what I realized with this, you know, working in your sketchbook and making the marks and then get, getting rid of them, it's, it's exactly the same thing, only it's with images and marks. It's editing. You're constantly editing. And you're constantly finding relationships between shapes or marks and, and you watch this larger piece emerge. And to me, that's just fascinating. And if, you know, if I just drew it, if, I, if, like, if I liked an image in my sketchbook and I, I thought, okay, that's great. I really like this piece. I'm gonna make it on a bigger piece of paper. And if I just did it on a bigger piece of paper, it wouldn't have that energy. And I, I just uh, lately I'm just thinking that you just have to have that process where you it's intuitive and then it's thinking and then it's erasing and then it's putting something over it and it just and then you end up with something that is nothing like anything you could have imagined but you know it, there's something maybe pleasing about it at least it has to be to me so that's when I stop maybe <laughs> well, I think artists that uh, uh, practice intuitive actually are, are very um, in tune with their marks and lines and shapes and space. And that after you practice, I mean, practice begets work and more work, that you do have a dialogue and a type of line or shape or energy that represents your work, that represents you. I, I, I think that's true. And I, you also touched on something that's so important. And I know um, a lot of people have a hard time with this. Work does lead to more work. And I remember um, Ann Coddington, who's a, an artist in Illinois saying that one day, and it was just very casual when she said it. But the point is just get into the studio and go and do it. And, you know, just, it doesn't matter what it is. You can be like, take a little piece of paper and make a mark on it, but that's gonna lead to something else. And I, I found that, especially during, you know, this whole COVID thing um, to be really helpful. I've been in the studio just about every day. Yeah. Um, yes, one good one good thing about the pandemic is yeah. that it, it yeah. did force people to work or to have time to do that. Um, there is a comment that says, wow, what freedom uh, in your work. So oh, thank you. Do you, That's, um, do you, go ahead. Yeah, it is. I mean, I guess I the more I hear um, from people who've actually 
gone to school and gotten their masters. That's a pretty brutal, um, a brutal thing. And I'm in a way, I mean, sometimes I feel like, oh my God, what am I doing making art? But I'm really grateful I was never beaten down. And I think it does give me a, a freedom, but I'm also a pretty tough critic with myself. And if, if I don't like something, I mean, it's, yeah, I'm never, it's never gonna see the light of day anywhere. But um, yeah, so it is, it is free and, but it is hard work too, but thank, that's a lovely comment and I really appreciate it. So was this there an evolution for you from uh, words on a page to incorporating marks and imagery in color? from a writer to a visual artist? Are they the um, same? No, they're not the same at all because when you're a writer, you're always, um, I, I, in a way, there's a similarity. When I was a writer, I was always looking for the simplest way to say something. I worked in healthcare and healthcare is so, you know, full of jargon and I mean, and so I was always trying to find a way to simplify the words so that even I could understand it. And I, I don't know, I mean, so in a sense, what I'm doing now is very similar. It's simplifying a lot of stuff so that it's a cohesive image on a page. But how did I, I, I started taking classes. I just started taking classes about 20 years ago and found a whole bunch of wonderful people and people led me to other people and you know the whole thing just evolved in a kind of amazing way it wasn't intentional at all it was just that I gravitated to paper and I what I love most of all is just doing things with my hands it's always so physical and tonight I was trying to get some medium off my hands. And then I realized I had just pulled some skin off my hand. Wow. <laughs> it's very <laughs> physical <laughs> and it bled. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so it was just, I, I guess it was always there, but it was, I just needed the right wonderful people who were teachers to help me find it. Mm -hmm. So is there a uh, component of mystery to your work and for the viewer who looks at your work, who's, who's seen your work? Yes, yes. I'm so glad you asked that because just today I was at my framer picking up a bunch of um, pieces I had framed for a show I'm having. and the framer bought one of my pieces. And Great, congratulations. Me, thank you so much. But to me, it was um, a kitchen scene. It was sort of a kitchen still life with a wine glass, of course, and you know some other, some fruit and a crock and whatever. But to um, the, the man who bought the painting, to Bruce, he saw a very primitive figure. I love that. I love that I can put something on Facebook or Instagram and somebody will say, oh, look, it's an elephant. And I'll be like, what? An elephant? How do you? And then it is. I mean, I, it, it's really wonderful. That's what I love about abstract art. It's so people can relate, you know, if the colors are sort of, you know, bring you in and then you find your own meaning. And that I think that is so exciting. It, it really makes me happy. Nice. Uh, I'm going to have Alex and anyone else who wants to unmute and uh, ask questions or just uh, general dialogue. Uh, that uh, Alex also has a background in graphic design, and I know that he was ready to put that art skill into a more fine art venue and. How did you transition, Alex, from, from that you know, design business to being able to have the freedom to make things that you want it to make? I did some of it when I was still, when I still had the business, but I didn't have near the time I've had. So there weren't very many pieces. I was never 
prolific. Uh, and I started doing um, some of the wood things and uh, I did some, you saw the one concrete thing. I did some I'm in various mediums where I was always, uh, <clears throat> in fact, I called them ball boxes. I was always dropping a ball in a box and, and then creating some illusion that would keep it there. Um, and that, that sort of transitioned to work on wood without the ball, which transitioned to the fabric, which transitioned to the paper. And now I've done a series of, I think about 15 or 20 pieces where I'm just overlaying tissue on top of tissue on a black ground. Mm -hmm. And I've got about 15 of those on my Instagram page. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that came about um, is I've got all these pieces of foam core left over uh, when I when I mount my uh, paper pieces. I had these big holes that I cut in foam core, and I got these pieces that I have nothing to do with because they're too small for other paper pieces. And I just started doing this other work on top of them, and uh, they're. <laughs> they're smaller, they're quicker, they're more therapeutic. Uh, so that's going to be my new uh, break between between making boring pellets of paper. <laughs> you, you know, that was... Susie, I got a question for Susie, if I may. Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. Susie, when, you, when you go to frame something, do you just take it out of your sketchbook or do you reinvent it? No, I actually, I, so my sketchbook always stays in my sketchbook. It's, but, but the, that work informs larger pieces. So okay, it's just so get mood, sort of. When you, when you do the larger piece, are you doing the same subtractive process of covering things up? Okay. Yes. Okay. I like that subtractive process. That sounds so smart. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Alex is additive. <laughs> subtractive. <laughs> um, um, uh, so, so are all artists hoarders? I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, Susie and Alex kind of are. You know, they come out quite different, but you know, uh, they have. Alex saved that uh, that light fixture. So that eventually became a very important component in his art making process. Now I have a question for Alex. Okay. If you, so, you would see that light thingy every day or whenever you saw it. Did that somehow? Um, I. I don't know was that a seed for for something for for your work i always thought that it would make a great pencil holder <laughs> pencils and pencils and brushes and things like that where it would. You know, the, the rotating trays never have enough places to put things so i was going to make this big long pencil holder to, to use at the side of my work table but i just never got around to doing that uh, so I did see it frequently. I don't. I'm not sure where I kept it now, but but I'd see it. And, oh yeah, I gotta make that pencil holder, and then I wouldn't see it for a while. Oh yeah, I gotta make that pencil holder, uh, and then uh, then one day I needed it for something else. So. <laughs> oh, I love I have it. A question. I have a question for Alex. Do okay. you take um, your papers? Yeah. Do you take donations of you know? instead of recycling would you like people's papers or do you have plenty i got plenty okay <laughs> uh my my wife prints out everything she sees on her computer <laughs> so i have like three 50 gallon trash bags full of shreds uh <laughs> and it just keeps growing so and i have a refrigerator full of paper already made so um wow it's a small it's refrigerator, but still, I've got plenty of paper made. So I've actually told her to stop saving it for a while. So we'll put it in the recycle container rather than me being in the recycle container. Alex, have you started the, a new project yet? I'm finishing, I just finished a commission, which was a portrait. 
uh, and now I'm doing a floral. Uh, and I've had this water lily I've been threatening to do for a few years. And uh, um, I'm doing it. Actually, what happened is I, I was looking for a way, I've been looking for a way to do something with smaller pellets. And mm -hmm. I can't make the paper pellets smaller very easily. Um, so I started making little quarter inch ceramic tiles. And I started this water lily in these little ceramic tiles. Uh, but one, it doesn't work. And two, it's just too damn labor intensive. <laughs> uh, it's very hard to get the tiles exactly the same size. So keeping it square is more difficult. I did one 15 by 15 part of the grid and it was like, gee, this was just too much work for a water. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to do something with the little tiles. Um, I don't know what yet, but um, the tiles are, I paint them and I lacquer them and they look like a regular tile. Um, so there's something there, but I haven't stumbled upon just what yet. But I'm having a lot of fun with the tissue things. Um, uh, somebody on Instagram had posted uh, I, I forget her name, but she does collages. And she had done several collages with these uh, long, narrow rectangles. And um, that got me started on the tissue. And then once I did one with rectangles, then it just went all over the place. Uh, anyway, if any of you on Instagram, it's alex.karadowski on Instagram. Uh, all my art is there. I don't use it for anything else. So there's no family photos and all that crap. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, Thank uh, you. <laughs> the things are on there just, just a chronicle. And my awesome. website is too as well. Uh, Nancy, did you have a question? You use, uh, saying you had stuff in your refrigerator. <laughs> I just wondered how many blenders Alex goes through. <laughs> <laughs> Three so far. <laughs> Not too must bad. be a good brand. What? That you must have a good brand of blender. Well, uh, the one in that photo is a new one, and um, I don't like the way it works. I use I use an older one, so that that'll be the only put food in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, also a, in the. Go ahead, Janet. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say in the chat. Um, uh, Zach put Alex's website in Susie's website, but not Alex's uh, Instagram account. So you'll have to go to Instagram for that. Um, if you haven't, but go ahead, Janet. What was your question? Well, I had a couple questions for Susie. I was wondering, hi, Susie. <laughs> I was wondering if um, when you're working on your sketchbook, uh, if you sometimes go back way back to other parts of the sketchbook so if you did you're kind of working on the whole thing at once and then the other thing i was wondering because uh you were showing us page like page spreads but essentially those spreads could go in different ways too um do you ever take your take like a vignette or a detail from uh one and make that something that you enlarge or or like do you use a Find a viewfinder kind of thing, like to check out different areas, or I want to do that. I, <laughs> I, I do go back and forth in the book. Like if if I'm happy with something, it's really hard for me to just leave it alone. Uh -huh. I have to go back in and make it so I'm happy with it. It just you know it's sort of a curse because sometimes it's just oh please give it a rest. Um, and then but translate something into a bigger piece i will go into the piece with the idea of what i like in my sketchbook and I, i'm fairly close but it never it's never going to be just like oh i like this in my sketchbook i'm going to do it in right. a bigger piece it has to go through that process that subtractive process oh my god i love this word <laughs> i'm so excited yeah, that's great. That's good. Yes. 
I like that. Subtract. I like to use an eraser sub for a subtractive process. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For marks, an eraser on charcoal. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Gina. And yes. Uh, Zach also did put uh, the face uh, Instagram links in the chat too, if you want those or want to view those. Um, well, are there any more questions or comments? This has been wonderful uh, uh, to see your, th and, and Leander Spangler said, thank you for sharing. And I agree, thank you for sharing your process and your uh, materials in media. And, um, you know, not all artists will do that and, and be so open about it. And to me, this is really one, I love this part of learning about how you make what you make and how you arrive at what you make. So I hope that we continue to do this uh, uh, beyond pandemic via Zoom or someday maybe we can actually visit uh, a few studios and, and see how artists make their work. Cause that's always intriguing too, how artists are organized and uh, or disorganized. Like I would have to clean my studio before you could come in. Excuse me, Catherine. I just noticed that uh, Zach put my name wrong on the oh, Instagram. Yes, he left out a W. Correct. Yes, yes. So, Zach, I don't know if you're going to try can correct that or add it again, but I think everybody knows. Fixing it right now. <laughs> All right, thank go. you so much. <laughs> I just wanted you to know that I posted on Facebook that this, tonight is the first in the series. So oh, no good. <laughs> <laughs> so we will be doing it again. No, we want to do this. This, this is wonderful. I mean, yeah, this I is great. Yeah, you know, to, to you so be much. able to talk or, you know, Alex or Susie, any last comments you would like to say about your work or any, any last wisdom for us? No, I, I wisdom out. <laughs> you know that's a that that's attractive word took it out of me <laughs> <laughs> okay everybody has to use the word subtractive in their you know dialogue tomorrow you okay you I, I, had to give, I had to give Susie a word and she was a writer <laughs> uh, there you go <laughs> oh. <laughs> Great. Thank you both so much. Really yeah, wonderful. Thank you both. Thanks. This was great. All right. Our thank pleasure. you for participating to everybody tonight and hopefully we'll see you soon. Yeah. A lot. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night now. Bye.